So back in 2007, I, um, uh, along with a colleague of mine named Gene Ku, who was, who was over at the Berkman Center at the time, um, we, uh, we came up with a project called Hub2, which was just using Second Life to, um, to engage uh, local communities in a planning process. And, we, um, and it, was, it was basically we, we, we use Second Life uh, in, a, in a localized context in that we, we brought laptops into a big room, we had people inhabiting a, a virtual space just as they were inhabiting a, a, a physical space together. And we tried to, to change the way that they talked about future spaces using the, using the virtual environment. Um, and we held a series of meetings and, and uh, the, the process was fascinating and, and the, the way that we began to refer to it was, was a sort of process of augmenting deliberation. We wanted, to take a, we wanted to keep a deliberative process, but we wanted to augment it through technologies of one sort or another. And, and ultimately for me what was interesting is that it, was, it really was about changing how people perceive and interact with spaces and, and what, what the sort of um, implications of urbanism could be uh, using, these, using these, bringing media in in these ways. Um, so that project, then I started, I, I kept working in, you know, in, in this space and, and uh, that directly led to a project called Participatory Chinatown, which was a, which was similar infrastructure, essentially a similar concept, which was bring the, um, bring virtu a virtual environment into a physical space and change the way that people actually talk to one another and deliberate about issues. But in this case, we didn't use Second Life. Uh, we built a, a, a game, um, uh, you know, we, it was similar in that it was an avatar, uh, it was sort of an avatar-driven virtual uh, game space. But in this case, it was much more of a game than we could, we, we, than we, we could create in Second Life in that um, the goal here was that you you picked a character that your character had a had a bi biographical sketch, and you essentially solved problems for that character. You were either looking for a job, a place to live, or a place to socialize, and it was in the process of problem solving for a character that we we tried to steer that into a larger conversation about planning for the future of China. So again, similar concept, much more robust execution um, in the in the Chinatown game. So Community Planet kind of emerged from participatory Chinatown in the sense that, you know, that I wanted to figure out a way to, to, to again, augment that process, the, the planning process, the town hall meeting. I wanted to change that, but I wanted to make a platform so that it wasn't, I didn't have to put all the resources into designing specifically for one community. I wanted something that could be used and reused in multiple situations. And so, Community Planet emerged along those lines, which is um, Community Planet is a, a mission-based uh, social media system that has that has game elements um, that is meant to um, teach and give people the opportunity to learn about and to to socialize and cultivate community around issues facing their local community before coming into a meeting for a town hall process. So the town hall is still there. So I'm not willing to kind of give up on the, the, the importance of people coming together in a face-to-face -face environment. I think that's still an important part of it. But, but what I wanted to do with Community Planet was, you know, instead of the town hall being uh, one hour of information download and then one hour of conversation, uh, I wanted to take a month before a, before a meeting to get the community dialoguing about, about what's at stake and then bring them together for, for a town hall. So it's, so it's a, a changing of the process a bit. It's, it's, a, it's using this online platform to kind of front load what hopefully will come of the face-to-face. Of the -face. And even if people never show up in a face-to-face -face environment, the, you know, what you still have is a record of conversation, a record of, of, um, of, of uh, ideas and thoughts about, about um, a planning issue that can then kind of carry with the community as it goes through the multi-year process of planning for whatever it's, pro whatever it's planning for. So, you know, in, in a more clear sense, you know, Community Planet offers any, the ability for any community um, or someone in a community who's planning for something to create questions, prompts, challenges, um, and, then, and then invite the community to participate in this in a timed fashion. So. Um, what happens is it starts on a particular day. There is a mission that's a theme, 
that mission goes on for a couple days or however long you want it to go on, and then it ends, and then a new mission starts, um, and then that goes on. So essentially, you're 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 taking a community through a conversation. It's not just here's a platform and let's talk for a month, but it's a very structured and curated conversation that then leads to uh, that then can directly lead to sort of problem solving uh, on on the community level. So um, so. The individual player simply answers questions, they, um, they respond to people, they pose challenges, they rack up points, and then ultimately those points um, translate into what we call tokens, and then they spend those tokens on their values. So we have a, a, a preset list of values that, um, that the community can choose from in what we call the, the token depot. And so once they earn tokens, then they can go to the token depot and spend their tokens. And then they have a map, essentially, uh, it, I mean, it, literally a pie chart that shows how the community has spent their tokens. Even the town hall meeting is a, is a structure for engagement, right? It's a, it's a structure that many people are familiar with. That you come to a place and, and someone will tell you what the issues are and then you'll, you'll talk about it. And, and, and most people are, or not most, but many people are comfortable with that, with that format. But it is a structure. And the way that I think about this is that we as a society are communicating in different ways now. And, and government, for the most part, is, is uh, not taking advantage of the ways in which people are communicating to actually engage people with, within, their, uh, within, within cities and, and within communities. And that's, a, that's really short-sighted. I mean, so as I see it, it's not, there's nothing particularly innovative about using uh, uh, you know, games to engage people. It happens all the time. What's innovative is that, it's being, it's hap you know, that we're trying to put it, make it happen on a, on a, in the civic space. Because for some reason, that's been a blind spot. You know, that, that the seriousness of government deliberation and, and government processes, it somehow overrides the need to come up with engaging strategies for people that that somehow because uh, the issues that are facing local communities are are you know not a laughing matter and not and shouldn't be fun and games um, that we we think that even the process of engagement should be not engaging <laughs> and uh, very serious and it's a it's a as I see it that it's a really um, not a very productive way of thinking about learning and it's not a productive way of thinking about how people engage in in um, in their communities whatever whatever community we're talking about so um, so you know what one of the things that we're experimenting with is that line between that perception line of you know when, when someone said when someone hears that there's a game going on uh, about their community will they say well I don't want to do that that's for kids and that's not that's not what I'm interested in versus oh this is actually kind of fun or or um, or I'm kind of motivated by getting points or, you know, well, what is that line? And that's one of the things that we're looking at right now is, is specifically looking at the perceptions that people have of games um, within, a, within a community context. My hunch is that that's something that's changing, um, that, that people are um, much more aware that, um, of the structures of social media and game dynamics for their everyday communication patterns. And they're less apprehensive about adopting those things within a within a sort of serious civic context. So I want to take advantage of that. What I see is a changing perception, um, and and see how how deeply we can integrate these things to to um, you know as a kind of hook, um, but not in a, in a manipulative way, but as a as a way of just communicating to people that civic participation is not deathly serious all the time. That there's actually um, there's actually a sport involved. There's actually it actually can be fun to to contribute um, to the sort of general civic landscape of, of ideas and, and possibilities, and and it's just about energizing people in the space that that I, I feel is in so many cases kind of dead. Technology is fraught with all sorts of difficulties. Um, with there are still there continue to be access issues, of course, um, to the technology. There continue to be participation gaps in the way that 
in, in how comfortable people feel in, in using technology. Um, you know, there's there's generation gaps. So that so technology is not an even landscape. You know, so saying I, I want to employ technology in this space, there are problems there. There are some people who are more comfortable using what have become familiar interfaces of social networking or games than others. Um, that said, there are some people who are more comfortable in attending a town hall meeting than others. And and as I see it, the it's not that I want to replace all of these processes with technology, but I want to bring technology into an ecosystem of participation possibilities. I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, the um, the right now it's a it's an academic project. It it, uh, it is um, um, I don't know how how comfortable I am with you with this being sort of broadcast, but um, but it's a you know it's a it's an academic project that is meant. I want to find a way for it to be maximally useful to the most amount of people. I don't know what that looks like yet. Uh, certainly, it needs a revenue model because it needs support. Um, and and there are you know there are, there are for-profit models where you can imagine a, a system like this as being a subscription uh, subscription based. Um, you can imagine planning agencies paying for this sort of thing. I think that's a viable model. I'm not sure it's the best one. Um, you know, another model would be there's some way in which it's essentially free to use, but has some other support mechanism uh, in it. Um, so I don't know, and so some of it is going to have to, is going to, this is going to work out, uh, I'm going to wait and see what the interest is, how people are using it, and I'm going to see what model emerges. Uh, that figuring out what the appropriate models are for these kind of civic innovation projects is a big deal, because, um, you know, for the longest time, foundations have blanketly supported an open source model, but the problem with open source is that it's not necessarily more accessible just because it's open source. I mean, it still requires a huge amount of technological support um, it, and expertise that, that most people don't have. I mean, it's, there's, still, there's still issues with that. So find what, what is the most open may not be open source at this point. And, um, and we just have to figure that out. And I, so again, I don't think I'm alone. I think that this is part of this larger civic innovation dialogue that, that, that we're having. Um, to try to figure out sort of pathways towards sustainability within individual projects and then also within this larger ecosystem that I'm talking about.